building, perhaps it is time to disengage from it. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Grassman, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for all the amazing work you have been doing and thank you for doing it so swiftly. No one likes to rip a bandage off slowly. Truly appreciated. It seems as if the citizens are now concerned about the financial state of the county since the January 3 actions. After being at almost all board and committee meetings for the last year, I urge you to go through the contracts with a fine tooth comb. We have many nonprofits connected to the county that maybe need to looked at a little harder. I mentioned this at this meeting because I believe many are connected to public health and mental health and could be draining the funds that are truly needed for other programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Hi, I'm Megan Ryan from Holland Township. I want to begin by thanking each and every employee of our public health and community mental health departments. Your efforts to help your community to be healthy and safe have not gone unnoticed. Thank you for sticking it out through a pandemic that challenged our physical and mental health and through the negativity of others who don't understand your mission. Please continue to fight the good fight. I have two points I want to make with the committee today. The first is to implore you not to make drastic changes in our health and human services departments without really hearing from the leaders and residents who know them far better than you do. One area the new commissioners expressed concern about on the campaign trail is reproductive health services. While you may not like all the resources used, the department's efforts here have been working. Last year, John Shea noted that, quote, in Ottawa County, teen pregnancy rates have decreased 76% over the past two decades and are currently the fourth lowest among Michigan's 83 counties. End quote. Also, he wrote that, quote, rates of abortions in Ottawa County have decreased by 18% among all women of childbearing age. End quote. These are really hopeful statistics that everyone should be happy about. Please let the health department continue to provide services that lower these rates. If they are forced to pivot to pushing abstinence, this would violate the rules of the Title X federal funds they receive, per John Shea's memo, and a loss of funding and unbalanced focus would likely lead to higher teen pregnancy and abortion rates. I do understand the desire to promote God's standards in this area, but as a fellow Christian, I believe this is best done on a person-to-person -person level and not at the county government level. Let the health department keep our neighbors' bodies safe from disease and unwanted pregnancies so we have more time as individuals to reach their hearts, which is what will change behavior. My second request is that you do nothing to further Mr. Kelly becoming the administrative health officer. I know this committee played no role in that appointment, but many of you voted for the change. There is not an opening for our health officer, and I hope his paperwork will never be submitted to the state. If it is, when they decline him because there is no vacancy or because his experience is not in public health, please don't use county resources to dispute this. Kelman Legal may enjoy getting their name in the news again for such a story, but it would only benefit them. The county would waste resources fighting for an outcome that would only hurt our health department and community health. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Do you have anyone online? No? Okay. All right, moving on to our consent items. We have two items under our consent agenda, the approval of the agenda and the approval of the proposed minutes from the December 14, 2022 Health and Human Services Committee meeting. Does anyone wish to remove an item for discussion or consideration? Madam Chairperson? Yes. Yes. I would like to motion to, um, for right now, number two in the consent agenda, uh, request that we move that to the regular agenda due to missing video from 1214 of 2022. Okay. All right, so we will move our uh, proposed minutes uh, from 2022 to, um, did you want that to move that to an action item or to the discussion item? Let's move it to a discussion item. Okay. The other commissioners think. All right, we will make that a number two then under our discussion items. Okay, so um, I, we have one remaining consent item then, the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent items? So moved. Support. There, thank you. 
So it's been properly moved and seconded to approve the consent item from our last meeting. Oops, I, or just our agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of, of actually, we probably need to do a roll call vote. Is that, do we have Commissioner Zylstra online with us or no? I do not believe he is online. Okay, all right. So then we can simply do a, a roll call vote or a, a voice vote. So all um, who agree, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. So the consent items are approved. Okay, so that moves us to our action item for this meeting, which is the election of the vice chair to serve this committee for 2023. Commissioner Moss, could you please handle the motion for nomination for vice chair? Sure, uh, action item one, I would move to elect Gretchen Cosby as vice chairperson of the Health and Human Services Committee. Do we have a second for the nomination to elect Gretchen Cosby for vice chair? I support that nomination. Okay, do we have any other nominations? Any other nominations? Is there any discussion? Okay, I believe this is a roll call vote or no? Um, with no Just, competition. Okay, all right. So um, all in agreement, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Okay, Gretchen Cosby will now be the... He just came on. Do we need to redo that or are we good? Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Sylvia. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Gretchen Cosby will now be the vice chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. And Gretchen, you want to come on and unseat Joe Moss here in the middle? <laughs> See, I've spread out. Here. I know you are. <laughs> Not that we're trying to unseat Joe Moss. But... <laughs> Still my purse. Okay, so we have several discussion items on our agenda, which includes department updates. So we will hear a short presentation from a department and then entertain any clarifying questions um, that the board may have. So we will begin with Human Services Coordinating Council, which is Patrick Seisler. I hope I'm saying your name right. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Patrick Seisler. I serve as executive director of two local nonprofits uh, called Community Spoke and the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance. So I first want to address one of the opening public comments that there is indeed no human services coordinating council. It, it is something that we've uh, tried to address on the agenda in the minutes over the years, but I see it, it cropped up again. So I do want to make that distinction. Um, I serve for two independent 501c3 nonprofits, Community Spoke and Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance. Now, I have been reporting to the Health and Human Services uh, Committee for a number of years, thank you, uh, because we do have a very active role to play with county government. So uh, given this is my first opportunity to engage with a lot of new commissioners, I thought today would be most helpful to just give some background as to who Community Spoke is, how we came about, and what our uh, kind of our role is and the work that we do in the community. So I did provide uh, just a physical handout, and I'm happy to follow up with some electronic ones uh, for any commissioners that aren't here today. But uh, to give a little history, there once upon a time was in Ottawa County Human Services Coordinating Council. It was a state mandated council. Every county in Michigan had them. I think they lasted for roughly 25 years. And there was a period of uh, kind of the history was when there was funding for those councils, they did a lot of work in the community. And when there wasn't funding, sometimes things didn't get done. But the original mandate was to have county department heads. So think mental health, DHHS, public health, sheriff's department, prosecutor's office had to come together on a regular basis. And the charge was to really look to avoid duplication in services and look for opportunities to collaborate in the health and human services space. Um, so again, this operated for a number of years, but as was pointed out, uh, that mandate did go away. And so there was a period of time where the county was trying to figure out 
does this does this council continue? Does it does it take a new form? And so what they ultimately decided to do was to uh, kind of seek a new iteration of that that council. Um, at the core of that count of that council always was collaboration. And, and so the question became, how, how do we continue to, to emphasize collaboration in Ottawa County? And so in 2012 and 13, conversations began to take place with a, uh, a local nonprofit called the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance, uh, LNA for short. And LNA is a membership-based organization. It serves roughly 200 uh, nonprofits in the greater Ottawa County area. It's a membership-based organization um, and really acts kind of like a chamber of commerce in many ways. So its goal is really to strengthen the local nonprofit sector through education, training, provide resources, one-on-one -on -one consulting, peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, and collaboration is at the, is at the core of the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance. And so uh, the Human Services Coordinating Council, to make a long story short, wanted to continue, wanted to continue to focus on collaboration, but thought it might be beneficial to bring in not just government collaborators, but nonprofit as well. And so out of that partnership came Community Spoke. So the council did formally go away, but the county still continued to play a role in the future of community spoke and a role in helping continue collabor uh, collaboration in the area of health and human services in Ottawa County. So who community spoke is today and the work that we've done for, for the last several years. And, and I'll also say, please feel free to interrupt and, and ask questions. I know we're, we're a little, we're kind of a little more of a, a nuanced organization. Not every community has an, an organization like spoke. Um, so who we are and what we do now is, uh, primarily has helped to foster uh, collaboration. Um, and we do that lar uh, oftentimes by actually convening and facilitating collaboration. So we've, we've undertaken a number of efforts over the years to address things like affordable housing. Uh, we helped kick off the initial housing next uh, what became housing next in our community. In fact, those first meetings took place in, in the main conference room here at the county. We've helped to address a number of issues related to mental health, related to older adults. Uh, one of the key roles we play in the community is actually to help uh, uh, facilitate strategic planning, community planning. Um, so every three years, we, uh, our community conducts the community health needs assessment, which is a deep data dive in the health and well-being of Ottawa County residents. We bring together stakeholders that uh, are involved in that process and help to facilitate what's called the community health improvement plan. Now it's called the Healthy Ottawa Plan. So a strategic plan to engage uh, with uh, improving the health of, of local residents. We've helped facilitate Ottawa Food Strategic Plan every couple of years. Most recently, uh, we, were, we were instrumental in helping to respond to the human services needs that were created by the COVID-19 pandemic and convening government and nonprofit leaders, schools, hospitals, and others to help address things like food insecurity and unemployment and housing early on. So a way to think about our organization is we are kind of like a floating capacity. We don't have any direct programs and services that we provide. Um, we are able to jump into what are the greatest health and human services needs in the moment. And the, and the language we use is that we are strategically responsive. So we don't have five-year strategic plans, 10-year strategic plans. We were designed to respond to what the needs are in the present and, and really go after them. Um, and so some of those examples that I shared are, are why we, we uh, worked in some of those uh, different spaces. One of the things we do operate that is on an ongoing basis is bi-monthly we have a convening of health and human services leaders in the county. Um, again, government and nonprofit. Uh, we meet, we get together as an opportunity to keep each other up to date on what's going on in one another's worlds, look for opportunities to collaborate and discuss some of these issues um, that are really important to, uh, to our community. So um, currently, just to clarify kind of the relationship with the county, because I know that, that that's a question, um, we do receive funding from Ottawa County on, on an annual basis to help support this collaboration between government and nonprofit. And we do have two county representatives that serve on our board as part of the partnership. So we have two county uh, board members, two LNA representatives, well, three LNA representatives actually at this time, um, and then one of our key funding uh, organizations that serves on, uh, on our board. So um, that's just a brief highlight. Again, I wanted to take the time today to give a little bit of the history. I'm happy to answer any questions either today in the meeting or offline, uh, but for future committee meetings, I will certainly come prepared to give some updates as to what are the kinds of things that, that, that we're tackling? What are the conversations and the questions uh, that we're engaging in um, at the current time? 
So one question that I have is, um, so who from the county is currently on that board? Uh, currently, uh, Lisa Stefanowski from okay. Public Health and Lynn Doyle from Community Mental Health. Okay. And prior, uh, John Shea was on the board prior, um, but uh, given recent changes, he's no longer on the board. Okay. Question, I used to participate in the community needs assessment. Yeah. I understood why we were counting ventilators once upon a time. Um, it sounds like you're doing the coordination of that. I thought that was through the health department. Have you taken that responsibility over as spoke? Yep, that's an important distinction. We do not coordinate the needs assessment itself. So, so the needs assessment itself is uh, primarily the public public health department. Three the three hospitals are involved. Community mental health. We are certainly at the table for that, um, but the public health department takes the lead. What the distinction is, once we have the data, the role that Community Spoke has played in the past is actually to facilitate the plan around the future. Um, so we've really honed in um, historically in three areas, access to care, healthy behaviors, and mental health. And so, uh, so an example of something that came out of that process is bringing the Pathways to Better Health program, which is our local community health worker program, that was a direct result of identifying access to care and mental health as top priorities in the community. Do you know, Patrick, is there any opportunity for coordinating, getting the information out to like the ambulatory settings? It sounds like you're collecting a lot of data. And I think I spoke to Lynn actually about LNA. Um, I have worked in the care management space as well. And knowing what resources are available for a particular patient, given their personal needs, it has always been a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and just wondered if there was like an assessment of the, the, the needs in our community, the resources that are available before we add more um, not-for-profits doing that kind of, do we have enough for food resources? I know housing is an issue, but um, I think in the ambulatory space, there is a, a gap as far as getting that information out on a day-to-day -day basis. You mean once the data is collected? Yeah, once it's yeah. collected. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that, that's a great point. And I think, you know, those who are involved in the committee try their best to get the, the the data out there and into different settings and certainly hospitals are involved in the process mm -hmm. um but always opportunity to get the information in, in more hands thank you yeah any other questions yeah mr moss sure um i you mentioned uh i think lakeshore nonprofit associate or alliance lakeshore nonprofit yep. alliance yep can you explain kind of your like do you have a role with with LNA or what the connection is or yeah so this is this is where it gets really muddy so uh we are I am actually employed by Community Spoke which is again a 501c3 nonprofit the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance actually leases staffing services from Community Spoke so myself and my colleagues work on behalf of both nonprofits that was what we created 10 years ago when we had very limited resources and so we hired one director to kind of carry out the the vision of both uh, both organizations but to, so today depending on what setting i show up in i'm i'm, I'm either representing spoke or lna thank you i guess for the rest of the commissioners if you'd like to learn more about lna you can go to their website we have a lot of helpful information, um, information on systemic racism, implicit bias, white privilege, uh, understanding microaggressions, racial equity tools, and lots more. Um, another question, what, um, what is the funding level that you receive from the county? What is the funding level? Yes. Uh, for, for last year and this current year, 45,000 is what we received. Okay. And what is your total budget? Roughly 300,000. And so who are your who are your other funders? For Community Spoke? Yeah. Uh, the two community foundations. So Community Foundation of Holland Zealand, Grand Haven Area Community Foundation, the United Way, and then we receive funding through the relationship, uh, through the staffing relationship with the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance. So again, LNA leases those services. So that's a significant portion of the budget as well. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I do. I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so of the three hundred thousand dollar three hundred thousand dollar budget, you said forty five of that comes from us, and then you said that it's the Holland, um, the Community Foundation for Holland Zealand and United Way. So the remaining, like who, like who donates? 
who's your larger contributor or is it like 50, 50 split as far as funding from those two sources? Just guesstimates are fine. <laughs> I, I, I just want to make sure I understand the question. So the, besides the County, the other three primary funders are the United way and then the two community foundations. So oh, okay, a okay. Grand Haven area and then Holland Zealand. Ah. Um, I think the community foundations are, are equal in terms of their contribution and and then the united way is a little bit less than that gotcha okay thank you sorry yep you're welcome any other questions i think we're good all right thank, thank you. you okay next up we have lynn doyle with community mental health morning how is everyone I'm um, glad to be here, and I'm going to try to give you the shortest description of CMH that I've probably ever given. It could take me a couple of hours to actually give you a real thorough understanding of everything we do and um, everyone we serve. So our mission at Community Mental Health of Ottawa County is that we partner with people with mental illness intellectual de develop and developmental disabilities and substance use disorders and the broader community to improve lives and be a premier mental health agency in Michigan. Our vision is to is that we strive to enhance the quality of life for all residents. Um, we are a public multi service agency of the, and we're a mental health provider for adults with serious mental illness, children with severe emotional disorders and disturbances, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and persons experiencing substance use disorders. Our funding for services is primarily through Medicaid, but other funding sources include state general fund. We have multiple federal and state block grants. Uh, we have a mental health millage. And there's also local county matching funds. Um, we are, our services moved in about, uh, I think it was 1998, from a fee for service model for Medicaid to a managed care model that includes uh, capitated payments. And what that means is um, we, we don't bill the department or the state for the services that we provide on a fee for service. We actually get a set amount of money every year through um, our region, which is the Lakeshore Regional Entity, and that's the money we have to spend for the year. We have uh, multiple in-house services, including case management and supports coordination. Those are the same thing. It just depends on what population we're serving. Uh, we offer counseling, psychiatry, nurse practitioner services, nursing occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language, uh, crisis services, um, access and intake services, uh, navigator services, which um, are staff who help people really to get connected to the mental health services that they need in the community. Um, we have an assertive uh, community treatment team. That's a team that actually goes out into the community uh, to folks' houses because they're they struggle to come in to see us in an office setting. We employ peer supports. Uh, we're out at the jail providing services. We have a program called Senior Reach that uh, is primarily or entirely serving um, older individuals in our community, uh, community health workers. We have a recipient rights department. We also have um, a very significant provider, contractual provider network that we work with to sort of round out our services. So those um, providers do things like um, our ABAs, or sorry, Applied Behavior Analysis. We're also, I think we might have more acronyms than any other department in the entire county. So if I say something that you don't understand, just raise your hand. Um, so applied behavior analysis for folks on the autism spectrum disorder are typically um, contracted out. Our community living supports, our clubhouse for folks with uh, mental illness, um, all of our residential supports. Um, we work with all of our local and state psychiatric inpatient hospitals, and uh, most of our substance use disorder treatment services are also contracted out. 
we have um, roughly 170 staff. We have four sites. Two of the buildings are in Holland. One is in Grand Haven, one in Hudsonville. We serve over 5,000 people a year. Um, and our department is organized by, uh, de <laughs> by departments, um, family and uh, children's services, adults with mental illness, uh, services to individuals with developmental disabilities and substance use disorders. So that truly might have been quick, even though it might not have been quick to you, but <laughs> so that was a pretty brief explanation of who we are. Um, and I am happy, um, I know some of the commissioners are on our board, so I've been able to give you a little bit more of an in-depth description, but if anyone else would like that, I'm, I'm more than happy to meet with you individually or um, continue to pro provide updates at this meeting. So as far as updates go, some of the things we're currently working on, we recently received a grant through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to help stand up a children's mobile crisis service. Um, we've, we've tried that in the past with, without a lot of success. We just were not getting a lot of uh, uh, requests for that service, but um, we're trying again. And what's new with this particular grant is that there's um, a learning community involved with this particular grant cycle, which means Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is uh, intentionally gathering the grantees together to learn from another one another and provide best practice as far as um, that mobile crisis unit goes. So I think um, we can definitely, it, it's a good um, putting our best foot forward as far as working closely with others in the state to, to figure out how we can best implement that program. Um, other things that are going on, uh, we've, we have services out in the jail, uh, mental health services. Um, we've been working with uh, the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice at Wayne State University in a program called Stepping Up Initiative. And that, um, that's a national initiative focused on reducing the number of individuals with mental illness and co-occurring disorders, so co-occurring co mental health and substance use disorders in our jails, um, the, they've been helping, to, helping us to collect data um, and, and trying to identify who in our jails has a mental health issue or substance use disorder and how successful we are in connecting those people to either CMH services or services once they get out of jail so that we can reduce um, recidivism and also um, just help divert cases when uh, truly the issue is a mental health issue um, and, and it isn't the best place to treat them in a jail setting. So um, the data from the um, behavioral health and justice studies, we are planning on sharing with our countywide diversion council that meets quarterly. Um, we continue to get out in the community as much as we can and provide information about um, mental health issues and services. Um, we re recently participated in a panel discussion about suicide, um, did a meet and greet with one of our partner organizations about mental health services. Uh, we continue to meet with various parent groups to talk about things like affordable and accessible housing, which is a, a significant issue for us here. Uh, self-directed services and children and family services, among other things. So I'm going to leave you with that. If you have questions, um, please feel free to ask away. Lynn, can you, can, sorry, mm -hmm. lean in here. Can you talk more about the, the grant for the Children's Mobile, Mobile Crisis Service? I have it like in my mind what I think it is, but I don't want to assume. Sure. Can you give more description to that? Yeah, so um, it's a model uh, that includes a master's level social worker and then another uh, trained staff person who can be deployed out to um, people's homes who feel that they need that extra support. They feel like they're in a crisis situation. Um, how you define a crisis is really unique to everyone in that situation and best practice tells us that um, the family should actually define whether they feel like they're in crisis. 
Um, so the model um, requires that uh, to the best of our ability, we're able to get out to that home within an hour and uh, respond to whatever needs they might have. It's sort of diffusing the situation, but then also offering referrals and, um, you know, um, an explanation of what other services they might be eligible for. The program also has follow-up. So after that initial visit, the expectation is that there'll be some level of follow-up, either um, a, a visit again or um, through telehealth, either phone calls or Zoom meetings to make sure that those families are getting the services that they need and um, things kind of remain at a more stable level. Okay, so they call into like a crisis line and identify? Yep. Okay. Yep, so right now we're... We're trying to coordinate that service with another one of our programs, the community um, crisis intervention team. That team model right now has a master's level social worker and a law enforcement um, individual, either through the sheriff, the Ottawa County Sheriff for Holland Police Department. And what we're looking at doing as our model, um, and we're working on it, is using that team has the primary um, intervention, the, the folks who go out first. And if it looks like it's a youth, family, or child issue, then we have, we're, we're setting up um, some on-call staff who could then go out and meet with that team and kind of take over with the social worker. Thank you. Yep. May I ask you a question? Sure. Commissioner Miedema, thank you. Um, just wondering how a resident knows to contact you in that situation. I'm just thinking in crisis mode, it's not, you're already kind of in that emotional state, right? Yeah. So how do they know, how are you getting the word out? Um, how will the general public know to reach out and who to reach out to? So, so right now, because we're using that model that includes the crisis intervention team, um, 9 -1, they can contact 911. And then um, they'll, they'll contact the sheriff's department and that CIT team. Um, we plan on, and we have in the past done pretty extensive um, information sharing and education to pretty much anybody we could get in front of, including schools, um, um, you know, DHS, all of our partner organizations involved in health and human services to describe what that program is. And we had contact information uh, for the program that we distributed. And that's our plan for this go around as well. Mm -hmm. Has has any thought been given to um, setting up a different intervention number? Like I, I can just think of a number of families who would hesitate to call 911 and involve, you know, an official system with yes, their family. Definitely. I, I, I know that that's part of what we'll be, we'll be planning with this new grant is okay. um, options for how you can get involved. Um, you're right. Not everybody wants to call 911 at that point, and they shouldn't have to because not mm -hmm. um, the model, um, th that co-occurring model that has law enforcement and mental health um, I think will right now be the bridge for us mm -hmm. um, with the intent that we can stand up a, a standalone. Um, it's It's been very difficult to do that uh, given the staffing shortage, especially for master's level social workers, but I appreciate the comment. I think that um, best practice would be to have uh, multiple ways of contacting uh, that group if they need that support. Okay. Question? Um, I know you had said that you had tried this before and you couldn't really maybe identify or find kids that would need this, but how have you changed that as far as finding kids and families that would benefit from this? How did, how did you go about, uh, finding, I don't know, children, parents, families that mm -hmm. would be able to benefit from this program. So how did, what did you do differently to well, apply that's, for this? The, the grant just started, this new grant. Okay. And part of that uh, new grant includes um, a, a year of planning, 
-hmm. and how, and, and I think hopefully we'll learn from others who have been doing this or are currently getting engaged in it, um, what successes they've had with how to let the community know about this service. We, we, I, I think I can honestly say we, we felt like we exhausted our, um, avenues of informing people. It was also published on our website. Um, we, we sent, um, information home with schools, um, to try to get parents to be more aware, families to be more aware of the service. So, um, that's work ahead of us that we we'll continue to look into how we can really um, have the community understand and appreciate that that service is available to them and how they might use it. I think when you say children's mobile crisis, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, I'm not sure everybody understands what that is. Second of all, I, it's that word crisis. You know, when 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 are you in crisis? You know, mm -hmm. um, so. It's it's a service that you could call, even if you just wanted information about mental health services, you might not feel it's a crisis, but it's a resource for people so that they can get the information they need. You know, the intent is to have it be preventative. So if we can get things that are at a lower level and get people to the right place, it's it's much better for everyone instead of waiting until it's a true crisis that might need involvement from 911. So what other communities have used this model that you can now? Uh, well, um, right now, standing up a children's mobile crisis service at, is required through our contract with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So in Michigan, every CMH will have to have um, a model set up and available through their communities. And so there are some of some of the um you know the the more densely populated Detroit Wayne um have been running programs for longer. Um they're struggling for instance up in, in the UP just to find staff. So I th I think through that learning collaborative we'll be able to not only know about national models, but Michigan models as well. So will there be other options um, besides calling 911? Because I know as a mm -hmm. parent and talking to other parents that have children with mental illness, I know there's that fear of calling 911 and then having people come in and and removing a child and, and then having a hard time getting the child back. Yes. So those are concerns that I've heard talking to different parents. Yep. And there definitely will be, yeah. um, we, we will have other avenues of, um, requesting that service than, than just calling 911. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, just overall, what is the trajectory that you're seeing for the need for mental health services? I know you have a number of of different areas that you service, but um, what's the trajectory that you're seeing? So um, we have seen a, a definite increase in the number of requests for services, in particular uh, family and children services um, have now outmatched our requests for adults with mental illness. So the area in our organization where the, the most need is, is um, kids and families are asking for mental health services. Okay. Is that looking like uh, counseling at this point? Is there more to that? Yep. That? We have a variety of programs. It could be um, case management, it could be counseling, depending on, uh, we, we have programs that kind of wrap around kids and families and provide lots and lots of supports. Okay. One more statement too, or just um, the IDD population. You and I talked about, you know, are we looking at aging out of autism? Are we seeing kind of a trending of this population? I mean, as you look into the future from a long-term strategy, um, they are the ones that appear to have more resource needs mm -hmm. than others. Um, have you identified kind of what other needs you CMH may have um, based upon kind of the now the children going from age 26 mm -hmm. into the adult 
kind of situation and having more increasing needs. Yeah, that makes sense. That it does. There's, there's, um, the, that program and our services to individuals who are on the autism autism spectrum dis- disorder um, has grown immensely in the last 10, 15 years, um, and it continues to grow. So, um, you know, depending on where you end up as an adult, um, you know, not every individual on the autism spectrum has a a developmental, an an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. Um, So, uh, but they may have a co-occurring mental health issue, mental illness. So depending on where their primary needs and diagnosis are, Mm -hmm. um, they will continue to get services through our adult programs. Um, and there's, I was just at a meeting recently with our, uh, adult services from mental illness and, um, staff in that particular program are requesting some additional training, um, really, um, you know, just understanding how best to work with individuals and motivate them and, and get them to be as independent as possible. So it's definitely a, an area in our organization that, um, we've seen a lot of growth, and I, I, I believe we'll continue to see that. Thank you. Anything mm-hmm. else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, next up we have uh, Community Action Agency, Jennifer Brzezowski. pronounced it correctly. Thank you. Good Good morning, Jennifer Brzezowski, Community Action Agency. Um, I thought I'd start just with a a broad overview, kind of how we came to be. Um, So the Community Action Network itself um, was founded um, by the 1964 Economic Opportunity Act. Um, The intent was to um, fight poverty and lift individuals up um, that were in poverty um, to kind of help them, empower them um, to work through their situations. Um, So in the United States, there are over a thousand community action agencies. And then in the state of Michigan, there are 27. Um, So CAAs, the community action agencies, um, are funded primarily by the Community Services Black Grant, um, and that is, of course, um, also rooted in the community action, um, the same principle of trying to fight poverty. Um, So locally, um, we have um, several different programs. Um, We have a weatherization program um, that I spoke about at another meeting, um, a utility assistance program. Uh, We have a couple of food programs. Um, We also have um, home rehab program. Um, We run a home energy 101 program through Holland Board of Public Works, um, as well as a housing quality standards um, where we go and we actually work with some of um, Lynn's clients to go in and determine that the housing for CMH clients is safe um, to live in. Um, So we have a number of different programs designed to help those that are in poverty or maybe just a one-time crisis. Um, to um, help maybe identify what the causes of their situation and try to empower them and lift them up through those situations. Um, That's kind of a, um, in a nutshell of what we do, Um, we serve um, over 2000 clients a year. Um, We are a staff of seven, um, so that um, I like to brag about because I think it's impressive that we're able to do that work with such a small staff. Um, All of our funding um, comes through um, either grants, um, our local partnerships. So for example, Holland Board of Public Works being one. Um, And then we're also um, funded, we have an annual fundraiser called the Walk for Warmth, which is also coming up March 4th. Um, And that helps raise money um, for individuals that are past due on their utilities. Um, We do not receive county funding. Um, We are, um, however, employed by the county and overseen by the county, um, but we're run primarily off of that community services block grant, as well as the other grants that we receive, um, whether it be through MDHHS, or uh, we also have our food grants come through the Michigan Department of Education. 
what questions do you have? I know that's a, a lot of information, so I think it's best just to stop and, and kind of sort through some questions. What are the biggest barriers that you see in the future for barriers organization? And, I'm, are you predicting that you have more resource needs, anything kind of um, environmental um, that you might be concerned about? So I would say, um, I mean, funding right now has been going great. We've received a number of grants. Um, something that we've been working on is um, locally branding. Um, so we get confused with Community Action House quite a bit. Um, so something that we're working on through our strategic plan is talking about branding so that our customers um, in the community understand the differences between the agencies. Um, also, more specifically in our weatherization program, um, sometimes we struggle to find contractors to come in and do the work. So uh, we employ inspectors that come in and inspect the home to find out what issues there are um, as far as the, um, the energy in the home and the air leakage in the home. Um, and then we have quality control on the, the back end um, that just they see what work has been done and what needs to be corrected. Um, the the middle part is the contractors that we work with, and sometimes that can be a challenge um, to find contractors that are willing to come in and, and do that work. Um, we've had some success um, reaching out and finding some contractors most recently, um, so I expect that to continue to improve. Um, but in general, that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge because contractors are hard to find right now in general. I remember trying to get like shower grips in, into yeah people's yes. homes and just finding somebody to come in and put the grips exactly. in. Exactly. It's challenging. Yeah. Yep. It can be a challenge. Thank you for that. Thank you. Question. Morning. Hi. Um, a couple questions for sure. you, Jennifer. Um, first one, you mentioned sometimes it's like a one-time crisis and sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. Just kind of wondering if you can speak more to more of the data of that, of how, how often it's a one-time how often it's sure. longer. I'd also love to know how people come to qualify for services. Of course. Um, would love to know that process. Sure. Um, the data we're still trying to kind of um, capture a lot of that. So uh, we do have some internal policies um, that do not allow um, a customer to receive assistance every month. So we do have to put a cap on that um, because we're not intended to be a long-term solution. Um, we're trying to help people work towards that self-sufficiency piece. Um, so our clients will come um, one, maybe two times. And if they do come that second time, we're trying to dive in and find out why. Um, so some of the reasons they came in the first time, um, we're going to follow back up on that and find out you know, what they did to alleviate that situation the first time they came in. Um, so as far as numbers, I don't have exact in front of me, unfortunately. Um, we did see um, during the pandemic with people being laid off, um, we did see a spike in the number of people that would come to us more than once in a year. Um, but I would say um, typically um, we don't always see the same clients more than once in a year. Um, it just depends on the situation. So um, that's definitely data that we're trying to drive in or dive into a little bit more um, with a staff of seven. It's hard. So we're kind of um, shifting roles a little bit so that we have somebody on staff that can dive into that data and be able to talk about, um, you know, who's being served more than once and how we're actually moving people into self-sufficiency. Um, and then you asked about Eligibility, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's income based. Um, that is how our um, grants are led. So the majority of our programs um, are for individuals that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, so what we're going to look at is um, pay stubs. Um, they have to show, you know, photo ID, um, and then we're going to look at the the pay stubs to determine, you know, what what the percentage of federal poverty they're at. Um, as I mentioned, some of our grants are, or the majority of our grants are gonna be at or below 200%. Um, so what we try to do like with our walk for warmth funds, for example, is go a little bit beyond that 250% so that we can catch somebody that maybe is, is at 201. Um, maybe they're just a dollar or two over um, to be able to help with that. But we do have to collect 
pay stubs. We're looking at um, other sources of income like child support and all of those. So we have to gather all that documentation and input it to determine where they're at on the federal poverty scale. Do you work with um, other agencies within Ottawa County to partner or to kind of understand if maybe clientele is tapping into multiple agencies? Yes, yes, we do. So um, primarily with that comes up more often, I would say with utility assistance. Um, so one of our grant sources requires that individuals go through um, DHHS first and then come to us. So we have a lot of partnership with MDHHS. Um, we also um, speak a lot to um, the Salvation Army because they have utility assistance funding. Um, so if we have some of the similar um, funding sources, there is a lot of communication. So we see where else those funds are coming from. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, you know people aren't tapping into several resources and that um, you know, they have a plan going forward that it's not just gonna like I mentioned, month after month, um, for the same, the same resources. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I have one. Yes. So um, you mentioned that you're different than community action house, and they get you to confuse. Yes. So what is the difference between the two agencies? So community action house, from my understanding, they were actually formed, um, well, they're a private nonprofit, so they're not um, part of the community action network. Um, I think it's just so happens that they have a very similar name. Um, so community action house, uh, we actually work uh, very closely with them. Um, so they have um, street outreach programs. Um, they do some budgeting classes. So that's something that we would refer our clients to. Um, they run a tax program, which we used to run. Um, so they run that currently. Um, they also, um, they have a food club. So they have um, an operation that um, is similar to like a grocery store where um, their customers pay a membership fee and then they go and um, get groceries based on a, like a point system. Um, and then on the flip side, our services for food, for example, um, we have our funding that comes through the Michigan Department of Energy, and we're going to um, pack um, shelf stable items into boxes and those go out to our seniors. And then we have an emergency food assistance program that goes out to the general public um, for those that are lower income. Um, and again, that's not like a, a store like setting, it's going to be um, packed boxes or we would supply food to local pantries um, to get those items out. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, we have the Public Health Department with Adeline Hambly. Hi. Oops, hold on, I'm a little taller than John, I think. So, hi, I met a couple of you and everybody else. Nice yeah. to meet you. So, um, I know that we're running a close to time. So, if I start talking or sounding like an auctioneer, just like okay. telling you to <laughs> slow down. So, um, Ottawa County uh, Department of Public Health, we work with the community to assure conditions that promote and protect health. Um, public health collects and monitors health data and identifies health threats. We investigate health hazards, inform and educate people about health issues and threats, uh, mobilize community partnerships to solve health problems, uh, develop policies that support health. We enforce laws and regulations that protect health and link people to important personal health services. So some of our services include uh, clinic health. We do immunization, sexual health services, communicable disease prevention. Environmental health, we have well and septic inspections, uh, food inspections, uh, safe uh, sustainability services, medication disposal. Uh, community health, we have maternal infant health program, uh, children's special health care services, hearing and vision screenings, uh, dental health services, um, and some elevated blood lead program, uh, nutrition and wellness, substance use prevention, pathways to better health. Um, and I provided uh, just our short, I handed everybody, um, and for Commissioner Zalstra, I can email an electronic copy to you. Um, just an overview of a directory of services that kind of has a couple sentences about each program. Um, you know, there's a breadth of services. Um, so I welcome anybody to come and, and come down and talk and we can go in more detail. Uh, so we do everything from, uh, licensing racing carrier pigeons and to our medical examiner program 
uh, it's, uh, it's like a lot of different programs that we do. So I don't want to go too much into this, uh, but do you have a little overview? Again, feel free to reach out and contact me and happy to have you come down and tour and uh, learn some more in depth. So, um, oops, excuse me, sorry. So our local governing authority um, falls to this board as our board of health. Um, they're ultimately responsible for local public health administration and governance um, in accordance with local laws, rules, and regulations. Um, that second sheet that I provided you, um, it's you know, a very exciting read of all the MCLs. That is specific, uh, the local governing entity authority and the actions. So kind of the responsibilities, key responsibilities. Um, and again, I'll leave that with you and please feel free to reach out and we can discuss more detail. But at the very end is what I wanted to point uh, your attention to, which is the participate in the Michigan uh, local public health accreditation program as that leads to uh, my update for what's uh, upcoming. So accreditation is to assure our local health department uh, is maximizing the potential to protect and improve people's health um, and the community's health. And so we're accredited uh, to meet standards with a collaboration through the Michigan Public Health Institute, um, Michigan Department of Ag, Michigan Department of Health Human Services, EGLE, which is uh, Energy Great Lakes Environment. I still call them DEQ in my mind. So. Um, and MALF, which is the local, Michigan Association for Local Public Health. Um, and what they do uh, is there's a three-year cycle for accreditation, and that is, was put on hold um, during emergency response, and they're starting it back up. And so we are due and scheduled for that accreditation and evaluation by all the state agencies uh, in July of this year. And so um, the public health code uh, gives a broad... Uh, authority or power to MDHHS to assign a primary responsibility for the delivery of services to local public health. And so we have to meet these requirements. And so one of those requirements um, that we have to provide is something that's called a plan of organization. And that document comes through the board, come through this um, Health Human Services Committee first, and then goes to the board. And we have to have that approved at least 60 days prior to that July visit. And so I wanted it on your radar is that will be coming through um, likely in, in April for you to review. Um, I'm happy to provide an update about it as we progress in the process before then. Um, and so that uh, is the main, the, the plan of organization will provide um, Kind of answering all of those key responsibilities. So it's kind of a document that does that and then the board signs off on that. And so that will be coming. Um, that's the main thing that's coming up for us as a, um, an organization. Um, and so I don't have any other updates. I know that was like really brief and very surface level, but I know that you guys have another meeting after this. So um, again, please reach out if you have um, questions or concerns or would like more information. And then as a quick touch base too, I know that Commissioner Minima, I've talked to, I've, we've had a couple instances now and um, Commissioner Rohde. So if we have issues that come up and crop up that might reach your constituents in your area, we'll make sure that we reach out to you so that you're aware of that information. Um, and we also let John know as well. So it's on his radar in case it, it comes to administration. So you may randomly hear from us uh, for different issues that may crop up. So, okay, a couple of things. Um, one, we're not going to worry too much about time. I think we're pretty flexible. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I appreciate your overview. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, so, the plan of organization um, mm -hmm. that's coming up, would it be possible for us to get a copy of the prior one just so that yeah. we know what to expect? Mm -hmm. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, okay. And, um, so with your accreditation program, um, I'm not sure if I caught this all right, but so who all is involved in that? Were you mentioning MDHHS, Eagle, and MELF? 
those three are on? Yeah, so it depends on the program. So if it's clinical services, MDHHS will usually over, oversees the clinical okay. um, or some representative from there, and they do that accreditation. Okay. Environmental health will have, the food program has MDARD come and um, so the Department of Ag come and review all their files and records, okay. whereas our on-site program has um, EGLE come to review all of their permitting records. Um, and so it depends on um, what the service is, okay. who oversees that. And how is MELF involved in that process then? Um, they are mainly uh, an advisory body, I believe, for helping to set what the minimum program requirements are for each. It's kind of a collaboration between the agencies and MPHI and MALF to set what the MPRs would be, so what the minimum program requirements, what they're going to look at and measure when they come. It's a little bit of collaboration between all those groups. Okay. They don't actually do a evaluation. Okay, all right. And do you know how uh, how MELF is setting its standards? Are they are their standards set by Nacho, or I never know how to say that. Um, no, I they're most are administer the administrators, and so it's more of weighing in of what's reasonable as a metric. Okay. Um, the state evaluates the programs, but they don't run these programs, mm -hmm. so um, it's it's just evolves as. Uh, maybe programs change or maybe the metrics don't say what we're looking for. Okay. Um, so it's more of a evolving from the folks that are doing the programs to the, because the state doesn't actually run these programs. It's providing that input. Okay. All right. And probably if we get a copy of the prior, that, yeah. that should help. Yeah. Us. Okay. And the cycle eight, which is what cycle we're in, the NPRs, are all out um, that we have to meet in July. So I can send that as well if you want to okay. see the previous cycle seven and then sure. I can send that so you can take a look at what it looks like. Are there any other questions? I've got a few. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Addie, thank you for being here today. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated my time with you and Ms. Stepnowski when we met uh, last fall. Uh, just want to follow up on a couple of those things that we talked about when we did meet together. Mm -hmm. uh, one was, you know, we talked at length uh, about what the last two years have been like. And uh, looking back, if there are things that you would do differently, um, learn from, how to move forward, obviously very emotional. Uh, we've never gone through something like that. And so there's a lot to learn from that. Mm -hmm. One of the items that you brought to my attention, or actually maybe Lisa brought to my attention was, that uh, it's currently set up that when there is a pandemic or something of that nature, that the decisions for mandates uh, resides squarely on your shoulders as the health officer. And, uh, and that's a huge responsibility, it affects a lot of people. And uh, she desired maybe as we look forward to have a discussion around creating a panel of, of people that, uh, folks from multiple different sides would trust to decide the uh, uh, need of a, a mandate or something like that. And uh, and you seem to agree with that too in that meeting uh, that it would be better for a group of people to help uh, make that decision rather than just one be held responsible for that. Any further discussion since uh, then on that topic? Is that something you'd like to pursue? Yeah, I, I think um, it's always good to have more people weighing in. I know that uh, Commissioner Robert, you serve on the Solid Waste Committee, mm -hmm. and it's that's an excellent example of how um, it's specified in law. And so, for for folks that don't aren't aware, any changes to the landfills that are within Ottawa County, there's a very prescribed process that they have to go through to make changes, whether it's um, you know growing or wanting to be bigger, or um, in this instance, we're working on amendment for how fees are determined. And, um, but it's very prescribed in law how that committee is made up. It's like someone from this industry and someone from um, nonprofit and someone from, you know, the public and commissioner, you know, it's very prescribed um, so that you get a real cross section of the community to weigh in. And I, I certainly think that would be um, valuable. Uh, ultimately, 
you know, the decision, because the liability lies on the health officer role, the decision lies on the health officer role, but it's really great to have that cross function and multiple people. Plus, hopefully it would maybe build some bridges because it's kind of forces people from a lot of different perspectives to sit at that table and have that conversation. And it's always a little different when you're sitting right across the table from someone to have that conversation than it is over like Facebook or, you know, something like that. So I think there's some real value in that. I think it would be great to, uh, and, and John and I've had some conversations about some other ideas and programs, and I think um, it would probably be great to sit down and discuss that. I, I think it would be great to be really prescribed about the members, much like the solid waste um, committees so that you had a really broad cross section that represented the community well, so. Great, I hope we can pursue that conversation. I mm -hmm. hope that you'll lead in that as well, uh, Administrator Gibbs. Uh, my next question would be, we talked a lot about how the county's website is set up to provide information to the citizens of Ottawa County mm -hmm. and how, when we went to the sexual health portion of the health department's website, uh, last year, there was quite a bit more on there than what there is currently. And the more was links to websites that both you and uh, Ms. Stepnowski uh, agreed were, um, were not just informational, they were activist websites, uh, specifically powertodecide.org was a website that was linked to multiple times and bedsider.org uh, were both linked to multiple times. Uh, these are websites that are not just informational, but again, are, are activist websites and were filled with vulgar material, vulgar language, anti-Supreme Court uh, information, how to subvert your parents to get access to uh, medical care that uh, they'll never find out about, um, and additional things that uh, including abortion finders, uh, multiple abortion finders. And, and you know, this is information that is readily available to somebody who's in crisis mode, uh, because they've just found out that they have an unplanned pregnancy. And we certainly want to give information to them, but not necessarily put them into the hands of something that is going to take away from uh, uh, a, a calm process of making a decision, which might be one of the most important decisions that they make. Uh, when somebody's in a crisis pregnancy, they have three options, uh, abortion, keep the child and uh, adoption. Uh, these are the options that I would like to see presented on your website. Uh, I believe that uh, you do to some level have some support there to keep the child. I know that through Spoke, we uh, understand that we've got opportunities to uh, partner with Bethany Christian Services. Mm -hmm. uh, they're already a partner of ours and they might be able to advocate for uh, adoption to be considered, but um, currently, do you have a, a packet if somebody comes in and uh, test uh, positive for pregnancy, do they walk out of your facility with information in hand? Yes, yep. So to be very clear, we are not um, an abortion provider or promoter. So um, once that was found, I know we talked about this, that was taken down, um, part of it, I I believe um, when Lisa spoke, when we met, um, when that was originally started, that website was not a um, activist abortion site in 2018, I believe. And then- um, I think we disagree on that because Power to Decide and Bedsider.org have always been activist sites from the very beginning out of Washington, DC. So one of the questions that I had for you was you were going to look into, or, or Lisa was going to look into who advocated those websites to be the two that were uh, on our health department's website. Mm -hmm. um, any progress on figuring out who that person was? Um, I cannot say that I have, I can ask Lisa and find to follow up with her. I appreciate it. So. I appreciate that you both were in agreement that these were inappropriate yeah, um, we should not be promoting. So what what we provide when someone comes in and they either request a pregnancy test or one is done, 
um, is a pamphlet with information and it provides all of those contacts, whether it's Bethany Christian, um, also provides contact for like our, our MIHP service, um, which is maternal infant health program that helps a pregnant uh, woman through the pregnancy and then after and provides resources to uh, help if they choose to maintain and keep the pregnancy. And then um, I believe that there is information about providers, but it's all just a list of providers. And we provide that to them for someone to look at on their own and determine their next steps. I believe yeah. that we, we live in a county that has an enormous amount of support. You know, if you are rent secure, if you're food insecure, if you're just insecure and need somebody to walk through these difficult times, I think we have organizations here in Ottawa County, like Positive Options and many others that are willing to partner with us to give that kind of support. So I'd like to see us move towards that. Um, I'd also like to know, is there a new process in place to prevent uh, websites like that from popping up on our website again? Have we thought about how to screen that more often? Um, Cause I can go to your website right now and I can find um, links for the wear one campaign mm -hmm. uh, to organizations that don't exist anymore. Uh, you know, they're, they're yeah. dead. Well, dead since locations. We, you, um, we got, have gotten a list of all of the like PDFs and links that are out there. Um, and I know that there are teams currently working through those. So you might still find dead links Think that's not supposed to be back to our web provider until the end of February because there were so many PDFs in their file. So that review is happening right now. So we can find dead links and what's out there and what's not. Um, yeah, there, there's absolutely a, a process. And I can say there was one um, in the past. I know that when we were in general in response mode and everybody's working a lot of over time and hours that that priority, I think, you know, went right to the bottom and we weren't looking and people weren't checking. Um, we were keeping the dashboards and different, like, you know, new emerging information is kind of where the focus was and not going through all of our old websites. So, um, but that's been a priority. And I know we talked about that a little bit when we met, but uh, currently I can say all the PDFs and various links are getting look, looked through. It's not, uh, I think there are some dead links kind of a lot of places and not just even PDFs, but sometimes like linking to a state or another organization's website and it, it'll be, you get the 404 too. So those are all being reviewed okay. currently. Yeah. So just to wrap up, what I'd like to see is more con communication with the administrator on mm -hmm. a formation of a panel that you're describing. I think there's a lot of value in that. I hope fellow commissioners do too. Uh, I'd also like to see our, our health website to be a place of information and less activism. I think you've made good steps towards that. So I commend you for that. And then uh, I think if there's opportunities to provide uh, more information to the other two options that we described with adoption and also keeping a child uh, for those packets that go into the hands of those with unplanned pregnancies, I think that would be um, a fantastic follow-up too. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I just had one. I know um, uh, Lynn had mentioned um, uh, some staffing shortages. I was just curious if that's also something that your department is facing. Yeah, it's um, a challenge, I think, uh, for both like the clerical and medical, hiring any nurses or um, PAs, things like that. You know that that we're not unique. I think the hospitals and everybody else are seeing shortages with medical um, professionals right now. Um, so yeah, certainly I think it's kind of everywhere in the county at the moment. Um, I mean, I guess that's it's good and bad, right? That there's um, that everybody is is being able to work. I think and find good jobs, but it does make it hard to find talent pool. Um, so I would say that we're probably, in, we're in the same boat. It's challenging. Um, I know for environmental health specifically, it, we end up with a lot of um, folks coming from a different industry or being new grads. Um, it's very difficult to find experienced people that um, apply or, or wanna relocate and things like that. So I believe our, our nursing and clinical is the same. <clears throat> we don't, we can't offer bonuses and stuff, unfortunately. Sure. It's hard to compete with that. 
So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Joe. Sure. Uh, maybe just more of a comment. Um, I heard the word mandate used a couple of times so far. Just want to be clear that the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners has a very firm stance on mandates and that there will not be mandates in Ottawa County. Uh, information gathering, information sharing, things like that, helping educate the public, helping build bridges into the community it is great and appropriate. Um, but Ottawa County local government health department will not overstep parental rights. So I just wanted to make that statement and make it ex exceedingly clear. And can I, I know that I've talked to John a little bit, if you could clarify, because we do issue orders regularly as far as sewage systems that are, have sewage on the ground and aren't being corrected. That's Technically, that's an order of correction. Yeah, I was so, referring to mandates regarding rental rights. Okay. Yeah, like mask mandates and the once in a hundred years pandemic, that kind of thing. Gotcha. So, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, I guess to add something to that, collaboration is amazing and um, always a good thing, but collaboration aimed at mandates would never fly. So I think that's it. I have one question. Yes. So just to piggyback on uh, Commissioner Bonham, what he said about uh, the activist links that were found in the website. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know how that happened. And how is that going to be prevented? And I think the person who did that needs to be found out. And, and how does that happen? Uh, you know, who's in charge of that? Um, because we do not want that, you know, to be uh, something that will happen again. Because I know that, uh, you know, we are this board of commissioners, a lot of us are, are very pro-life and, uh, and so we are, do have some concerns about activism and, and putting our kids and families at risk, you know, for finding this information that's supposed to be the way people interpret it. Well, the public health department condones that because it's on their website. So. Mm -hmm. No, and the public health department does not condone or support one or the other We're oh yeah to, I, I, yeah we just... learned that now but but uh, you know person that goes on the website will not know that mm -hmm. yeah even yeah, though you might not support it yeah and i think that's exactly why we're working to revamp how mm -hmm. the approval process happens and the review um from the after i know it was starting before we talked to commissioner bonama but mm -hmm. it was more solidified that review and links and our PDFs after we met. So I can do a report back, um, what's that, March, and give you an update because the, some of that uh, should be done and, and I can provide an update then too. I think so. I'd like to have a name too of who was associated with that process. So okay. please bring back a name. Yeah. I concur with Bonama on what you just stated as well as um, with the adoption and then keeping the child the options. And also concur with um, Commissioner Moss and what he shared about parental rights. And I am appreciative, um, Adeline, that you are doing that review and that you'll be coming back to us um, with that. It's very appreciated. Mm -hmm. Can I add one more thing? Mm -hmm. I just want to say I uh, have personally benefited from the um, hearing and vision screening. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight that and, uh, and say thank you. I think that was very helpful. Good. Very glad to hear that. Go ahead. Oh, no, well, I was just gonna say, there's another item that I would like to add for discussion if we could. Oh, okay. To, after this. After this. Okay. So All right, help. thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and somehow I'm missing where my agenda went here. Thank you. 
Okay, and then we have Kendra Spanger. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, um, you, that was that was correct. Okay, good. Department of Health and Human Services. Yes, uh, my name is Kendra Spanger, and I'm from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and I am the director for Ottawa County specifically. So I usually attend these meetings just to provide an overview of any updates that we have going on at the state level locally that would impact um, citizens and those in our community. So um, first one area that I think is very important that I want to make sure that you are aware of. A press release came out just recently related to food assistance. Um, and as you may be aware, um, individuals that were on food assistance from April 2020 on forward have received an additional allotment um, that they would not receive normally due to the COVID pandemic. And that will actually be ending in February. So we're getting that information out to the community and to those that are on food assistance to let them know, as that's a very considerable amount of money. Um, currently in Ottawa County, according to our statistics in December, um, we had 16,893 individuals that were receiving food assistance. So those are recipients, um, not households. Um, so about 7,009 children are impacted. So with that being said, that's over a million dollars that will not be coming into Ottawa County for food assistance relief starting after February. So we'll definitely see a large impact starting in March um, for those that maybe that were not prepared um, and knowing that their benefits can actually stay on their card for nine months. So that's information we're trying to get out so that people are preparing um, for those, again, that have been used to that for almost three years now. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Um, also, Medicaid. Um, with the COVID pandemic, um, individuals were able to maintain on Medicaid after they were found eligible, even if their circumstances changed. Um, here in Ottawa County, we have 37,275 individuals that are on straight Medicaid um, and or a HMO. And then we also have 16,023 individuals that are on the Healthy Michigan program. So between those two, we're talking of almost 60,000 individuals um, that will start having their Medicaid redetermined, um, which that means is starting in April, we have 14 months to redetermine every individual that's on Medicaid. Um, what that means is reviewing their eligibility to ensure that they're able to maintain on Medicaid. So the department has been doing a lot of um, publicity um, to educate individuals to make sure their address is up to date so that when they're receiving these notices, they're actually getting them. Um, so that if they are indeed still eligible for Medicaid, they're able to stay on that program. So those are our most recent updates and things that are impacting the community very shortly and wanted to make sure that you're aware. Um, other things that I wanted to share as well that I um, try to give updates on when I'm able to attend, um, hopefully monthly, um, is our increase in our refugee population. Um, Ottawa County is actually the second largest um, for refugee cases. Um, so here in Ottawa, we are very blessed to have an amazing staff that's in our lobby that is Spanish speaking and holds these refugee cases for us. Um, right now, we are at about 238 cases um, that she is, is handling. And again, just um, partnering with some of our agencies like Bethany Christian Services um, to ensure that those individuals are getting the resources that they are eligible for and are in need of. Um, and then on the other side, um, well, actually, go back, um, still with the eligibility side. Um, one thing that I reported out previously was the increase in homelessness. Um, so here in Ottawa County, back in March of last year, we pulled some data um, to see what the population coming to our department was that are claiming that they are homeless. We then pulled that information again in November, and the number, the number had five times um, increased. So you're talking in a matter of only eight months, um, a multitude of five. Um, and we're not talking just by one person to five people. <laughs> um, we're talking a considerable amount of individuals and just wanted to make sure that you are aware of some of that data. Um, I was um, privileged enough to meet with Jacob um, and Doug Zylstra uh, most recently related to veterans homelessness. Um, that is a population that they are looking at exploring. Um, that as well, um, we were able to pull some data for us at the department for the number of individuals that claim to have been served in the military and also were claiming as homelessness which mind you, there are many veterans that do not want state assistance and do not come to my department. Um, but for those that did, we had 20 in Ottawa County. So I wanted to make sure that you have that data and information as well as we continue to look at options to provide services to um, individuals in our community. Um, on the other side of my department is um, child welfare 
and Adult Protective Services. Um, adult Protective Services is actually overseen by our Business Service Center. And in March, I will give a large and um, an overall annual presentation to you so you can learn a little bit more about all of our programs. Um, but I wanted to provide just um, an update on Children's Protective Services and foster care. I handed out to you um, some swag, I guess. Normally I don't come to these meetings. I am a government entity. Uh, we don't have lots of money to be spending on swag, but um, the department did put together some information on becoming foster parents. So I'm providing this information to you because um, we kind of, I would say are in a placement crisis. We don't have enough foster homes to meet the need, um, especially here in Ottawa County. Um, we do have the largest number of foster homes in our region for a county. However, I still have five individuals, um, young men, 11 to 16, who don't have a home. Um, and so some of them are, those specific five are in residential. Some are ready to be in the community and I don't have places for them to go. So I am asking for your assistance um, in advocating um, and looking for homes for our kids to maintain in our community. Um, we hate to have them going other places that doesn't allow for reunification very swiftly um, when we're looking at parenting time. So again, just provided some information for you. If you can please pass that information along. If you do have entities, agencies, businesses that would like a presentation, um, either from the department or some of the private agencies that we work collaboratively with, we will be more than willing to do that um, again to find homes to maintain our kids in our community. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to provide some quick statistics related to that. Um, currently, we are the 13th largest county in the state of Michigan for CPS investigations. Um, we're not the 13th largest in size, um, but the 13th for investigations that we investigate. And then we are 23rd for the number of kids that are um, in foster care. So we're proud of that. We are very proud that we're able to keep the majority of our children in their homes and in the community. We have some great prevention programs that are available. And so we definitely highlight ourselves and um, give ourselves a pat, pat on the back related to that. Um, so currently we have 111 children that are placed in out of home care. And 44% of those are in licensed foster homes. Um, so again, we try very hard to maintain children um, with relatives whenever possible. And so that is why um, we have a little bit lower for the number of licensed foster homes. But So that's my quick um, overview. Again, I will be presenting in March and there is an annual report that is um, on previous minutes from last March as well um, to talk about our programs and some historical data. But I didn't know if you had any other questions. I do. Go ahead. Um, who do you partner with for foster care? Oh boy. Okay. So in our county locally, we have Bethany Christian Services right down the road from us. Um, we have Arbor Circle, Pathways of Arbor Circle. Um, we also work with Catholic Charities, um, DA Blodgett, um, Samaritas, Lutheran, Holy Cross. I think those are our major ones. Okay. Awesome. And then do you have are those agencies typically the ones that might come present to businesses or faith organizations, or is it you yourself through um, Health and Human Services that comes and presents? It can be any or all, sometimes okay. together. Okay, great. So do all, all of those agencies are providing foster care services contractually then with you? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I have a question. So the, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. You go. I was just, I'll go next. The homelessness increase. Yeah. Why is that happening? Ooh, that's a that's a million dollar question, probably. <laughs> um, honestly, in Ottawa, it's it's a um, it's a funding issue. Affordable housing. Um, I actually just spoke to one of my staff who is making decent money. Um, she's a single individual, and she told me to get an apartment around the corner from her office is fourteen hundred dollars a month. And um, she said, Kendra, I don't even make that much on my per, on a, in a paycheck. Um, and so it really is an issue of affordable housing. Um, we are seeing a lot of people that just can't, can't pay their rent. They're working full time and they still can't pay their rent. Um, so for a lot of ours, um, we have supplemental emergency relief, um, which is eviction diversion. Um, but again, the number reason why people don't receive it is because of the, the housing is not considered affordable to the amount of money they make. So that's our number one denial reason. It's interesting because I was in Kentwood last weekend and they're advertising hourly rates of $12 an hour at McDonald's, whereas here you look and it's like $17 to $18 mm -hmm. an hour. So yeah, our pay scale definitely is higher. 
Yeah, the cost of living is high. I mean, like I said, a one one bedroom apartment she's at around the corner and she tried other places and couldn't get in just because there was lack of housing stock. Um, and so 14, yeah, $1,400 she's paying for a one bedroom apartment. Um, in reference to the food assistance program, you mentioned that there was extra money coming in from COVID and that is going to end in February with the tremendous amount of inflation that we've seen and house or food costs going up, up, up. How are you planning on addressing this? Is there going to be something, you know, a stipend for people because the food expense is going up? I mean, I even like leave the grocery store and I'm like, how is anyone doing this? This is awful. Yeah. Um, there's nothing specific because these dollars were actually from the federal government. So yeah. the state is just a flow through um, to ensure eligibility. So with food assistance, we've continued the eligibility process. So um, I think probably even since April 2020, we've continued to do redeterminations for food assistance. So the people that are on are truly eligible for food assistance. So they're going to maintain their eligibility and continue with their original amount. Um, but the extra allotment is what they will not be receiving any longer. Yeah. Kendra, nice to see you again. Yes, you too. Um, you mentioned that homelessness is five times worse than what it was before. Did I hear that correctly? I just said from our numbers that we pulled from March to November of 2022, okay. went up five times. How do we measure that? Are, are they in our data, database somewhere? Are we doing head count somewhere? But so for we... us, they have to actually list themselves as homeless on our application. Okay. So you mm -hmm. have that many more applications that read homeless on it. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what number is that? What is it up to now? I can grab it for you. I don't have it right in front of me. Approximately, you have a guess. Is it? Ooh, I'm thinking it was 283. Okay, that's a pretty close guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I have one of those like, what do you call it? The where you look at something and uh, you know, photo yeah. photo brain. <laughs> yeah, around 300. Around, yeah. yes. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Thank you. And when you say homeless, is there a specific qualification? I mean, just outside homeless, or can they live in a family's basement, for instance, or a friend? That's a what great question. It's just a question they answer. Okay. Would you so consider yourself themselves. correct? Okay. Yep. So it's not necessarily HUD's definition of homeless. We talked about that um, in the meeting with the veteran homelessness. There's definitely different entities have to base homelessness on certain criteria. So it could be HUD's definition, which truly means you can't be couch surfing. You can't be going from friends to friends. You have to truly be either living in your car, outside, or in shelter. Um, so for us, there's not that um, small of a definition. However, to get supplemental emergency relief, there has to be an actual act of eviction and or something that denotes you as homeless. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. So, okay, go ahead. All right. Um, back to foster care. Yeah. Um, just my wheels are turning. Do you know, um, based on people who are become licensed foster care families, has any study been done on, um, I guess what I'm getting at is the best way of getting new families? Has Have you done any research on that of showing um, where you're getting more of your families that are like, yes, I want to do that. Sign me up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have an annual plan that we work collaboratively with the private agencies in our area. And our number one reason, our number one way of recruitment is word of mouth. So our foster parents are our number one recruiters. So when they're treated well by their agencies and feel supported, they're the ones that are able to go out and tell family, friends, their church community, their school, wherever they may be to say, you should become a foster parent. And here's why. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question uh, for a motivated family uh, to become a foster family. Mm -hmm. About how long does that take? Ooh, a really motivated one. Um, yeah. We have had individuals licensed within 90 days. Okay. How about average time? Um, our, our goal is always six months. Okay. So, and we in Ottawa have actually our, we, we receive data on how long it takes and um, for DHHS, for my office, um, our average last year was 181 days. We love the motivated ones, the ones that want to get all their paperwork in, sign them up. Is there a part of that process that takes a while? Is there like review, background checks, that kind of thing? 
Yeah, it's a pretty intense. I mean, it's some semi-intense process for a reason, right? Um, so yes, there's fingerprints. Um, for some, I think that one of our largest ones, not so much here in Ottawa, but when we have people that are on the border, because we can also take individuals that are in different counties and be licensed through Ottawa. Um, well checks take a while sometimes, well and septic if they're not on um, the city. Um, and then obviously the home visits and um, references, things like that. So thank you. You're welcome. So I actually used to license homes for foster care and awesome. adoption. So that was very cool. Um, there, there is an issue that um, I have heard a lot about in the past years about a barrier to becoming a foster parent. And I'm just wondering, so I, I guess I'm just going to lay it out and then wondering, are we doing anything about it? And um, it's rooted in an administrative rule that states that if you're biological children are not fully vaccinated according to the schedule that then you're ineligible to be a foster family and so I'm wondering like are we following that rule and um, it's it's a rule that a number of families have been denied based on and um, and definitely are also discussing in the community and so I think a lot of families aren't even uh, applying in the first place because they know about this requirement. Um, it's an administrative rule, not a law. Um, and so um, I think that's a definite barrier. And I, th I think that we know that with everything that we've been through with COVID and skepticism over the COVID vaccine, now that is increasing it's also leading to more skepticism about childhood vaccinations in general. And we hear about, you know, an increase in waivers through the health department. Um, so I just see that translating as possibly also an increasing, an increased barrier for us um, having the foster homes that we need. If more families are, are re, you know, are not wanting to do this with their biological children that, that are gonna face this barrier, to becoming um, licensed. Um, so anyways, wondering wondering what you're seeing with that. And then also uh, just thinking maybe there could be some ways that we could help advocate for some changes in that administrative rule. Um, and if so, you know, um, perhaps it's something we can, can work on. Well, I honestly was not aware of that being a requirement. Um, so let me do some checking on that. Now there are some differences between administrative rules and um, agency rules. Mm -hmm. um, so let me see if that's actually a department rule or if that may specifically be an agency rule. Okay, my understanding is that it's an administrative rule with the state of Michigan. And I can double check that. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Okay. And so then, Gretchen, you had moved a discussion of um, the approval of the proposed minutes from December 14, Health and Human Services Committee meeting. You had asked to have that moved under discussion. The discussion, just I went to review the the minute or well the meeting uh, last night and noted that it was not up on video and the meeting minutes are basically an outline and I can absolutely appreciate that. Um, there's a lot of information that's shared within these meetings, but I would like to before I approve meeting minutes actually be able to watch what transpired on December 14th of 2022. So I don't know what barriers that might create by not moving or approving the minutes. And we can wait to, to approve minutes. Yeah, so do we need a motion to to wait on that? Could we ask administration to if there's any knowledge on the video? Sure. John, do you have any knowledge of what happened with that video? I do not, but I will check on that. I believe that there's also another meeting for which the video is not up either. So I will check on that ASAP and see where that's at and if we can get it up as soon as possible. Okay. Thank Sorry you. for not giving you more advanced notice. I, like I said, I was sitting to sitting down to watch it and discovered it wasn't there. So. Right. We'll get on it right away. Thank you, Jen. I did um, message Stephanie right away when you mentioned that, and she was checking with Shannon as well. So okay. oh, they are okay. aware. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can simply just move that to the next meeting. So that'd be fine. 
Okay. Sure. Do you want a motion to postpone it to the yeah. next yes. meeting? I would make that motion. Okay. Okay. I'd like to motion to move the meeting minutes approval from December 14th, 2022 to the next meeting for Health and Human Services Committee. And that would be what date? Uh, <laughs> next what? month. The next one. I'll second so, that. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can do a voice vote on that. Okay. So all in favor of moving um, approval of the December minutes to our next Health and Human Services meeting, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Okay, so we will, we will move that to our next meeting. <clears throat> okay. And then I have one more discussion item, um, kind of a point of clarification more than anything else. There are three documents that I provided today. Excuse, excuse me. I think we need a motion to amend the agenda to add another discussion item. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Yes. Can I have a Go motion to amend the agenda mm -hmm. to add another action I, or discussion item? I'll second that. Okay. I'll get used to this. I really will. So. Okay. So then we need a vote on that. So, um, so just state it again, and we'll. Okay. Um, I would like to um, motion to add another discussion item to the current agenda. Okay, so I think we need a voice vote on that. Um, we need uh, Commission, Chair, Chair um, what is the actual discussion? Shouldn't that be part of the motion? I don't think it's part of the uh, original motion um, to, to have a voice. I'm getting a little confused. No, no, and, and uh, Commissioner Zalstra, I'm just adding kind of information regarding a applicant for a position. Um, okay, that, that's fine. I just wanted what, what the substance was before I vote on whether sure, it actually be a job. Sure, um, And Gretchen, <clears throat> is that related to HHS or is that related to talent and recruitment? That's related to HHS. Okay. Could I, could I add clarity um, now that J Doug uh, Commissioner Zastra has joined. Uh, according to board rules, we should do roll call votes since he's remote. Okay. Point of information. Um, with someone being on Zoom, are they allowed to vote or is it just discussion? Yes. According, we can go to legal maybe, but the quick answer is yes. Yeah. Because of the reason for which they're on Zoom. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So. So I guess we're doing a voice vote on whether or not we are. Technically, if Commissioner Zalstra is voting and participating remotely oh, for an approved reason, oh, we should call. go to roll call. Roll call vote on whether we're going to add another item to the agenda. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Belknap. Yes. Mrs. Curran. Yes. Ms. Cosby. Yes. Mr. Bonama. Yes. Ms. Rohde. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mrs. Miedema? Yes. Mrs. Ebel? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, I have provided, Doug, I've provided three pieces of information, um, a testimony from Nathan Kelly, um, and then also an article that he provided um, regarding connection between occupational safety and public or health and public health, and then an orga organizational chart just to kind of help with uh, questions that we have received from constituents and maybe some confusion. And I hope for clarification with this information. Um, and just to kind of start out, um, I've been a nurse for 30 years, 18 of which has been in a leadership role. I've been responsible for recruitment, development, and retaining healthcare uh, workers from various levels, from phlebotomists to actually MDs. When we learned that um, Lisa Stefanowski was retiring in March of 2023, um, we were trying to prepare, she was doing, a, she's doing a great job in preparing her department um, for that transition. But we knew that we had a fiduciary responsibility also um, to make sure that we did not have a gap there for our community. So um, there were applicants. We did not know about Addy. I, I really wish we would have. Um, but given my experience in, in healthcare and in leadership, I was the one that was actually reviewing applications. This is how we came upon Mr. Kelly. 
As you can imagine with the kind of current climate such as it is, applicants aren't like readily putting their names out there for consideration. Another little piece of my history that people probably aren't aware of in, in healthcare environment, I'm looking at Dr. Davidson, you don't talk about these things, but I was part of the COVID uh, testing center, development of the COVID testing center um, back in 2021, started in February. So my end of it, I worked with Holland Hospital. I was responsible for the operations side. So the donning and the duffing, the analyzers flu, no flu, uh, four pages of contact trace information that was provided to the health department every single day. We created an electronic health record. We scheduled visits. We went through a triage component as well. That was the other nurse who structured that. I am not alone in this. So when I'm using these I statements, I just wanna make sure that what I'm doing is lending credibility to why we've pushed Nate Kelly forward. I was also on the phone calls probably three times a week with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We use five different labs for our, our specimen collections. We lost no labs. Um, and I called every critical result for three months. So imagine um, that I also was receiving phone calls from both large and small businesses um, throughout the day about mitigation. How do we mitigate? We wanna stay open, we are essential businesses, but you know, it's like our occup occupational health honestly is a vector, and this is what the article will state to you, for public health as well. How do we not transmit? I was comfortable in my clinical space, but I certainly did not feel as if I was competent to make those decisions, you know, by you know, individual business space. And our objective is to keep our economy rolling. So when Nate Kelly's application came my direction, there was like a big sense of relief. Like we could, there's an environmental factor here too, to public health. Mm -hmm. So what I did, instead of providing testimony for Nate, I asked him to provide testimony for, for the, you know, for the commissioners, but it's also open into public, I put it into public record. So you're going to have Nate's discussion, you'll have an, like I said, an editorial that supports it and the organizational chart. Remember, this is an administrative role. And so he has support or the person in this position has support. You're not supposed to be the master of all, but you need, you need to know how to ask the right questions and have a strong team beneath you. So some of the qualifications, he talks about having a total our total worker health um, kind of concept and that in, in his administrative ma management and supervisory oversight. And some of the things that he has been responsible for and is actually expert at is looking at safe drinking water. We do have a drinking water issue here in Ottawa County. ISO and, and lab safety and containment protocols. We have multiple businesses with ISO certifications. He knows how to mitigate for radiation. Um, he's participated in emergency planning and management. And I think Lou Hunt would be very excited about having that opportunity. Testing for PFAS, um, identifying and tracking communicable diseases and transmission. And then also avoiding cross-contamination from workplace to community. And so identifying and mitigating our risk. And this is a skill set that I think not just, I mean, the community, of course, needs it, but also our business sector and our economic sector to stay alive or stay active and um, financially viable and growing. We are the fastest growing county in the state of Michigan, and we need this uh, I believe this man's um, both clinical and public health and occupational safety health um, qualifications. I think he's a real gift to the community. So, any questions? Uh, Commissioner Cosby, just one quick question. What, what are we actually discussing here? Is this just a piece of information you're giving us or are we actually discussing what you're handing? Obviously, I don't have it in my hand. Sure, so. sure, Doug, and I'll be happy to get that to you. It'll be in the packet. Really, what I'm trying to do is uh, there have been many, many statements. We, I think we all the commissioners have received emails concern, you know, concern from our constituents not understanding what Nate's actual background is. And so what I'm trying to do is provide information, provide education, um, and then to provide kind of some security that these decisions weren't made lightly. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I, I didn't know if there was, 
we were discussing what your information are bringing or just presenting information for us. Thank no, you. Presenting, thank you, Doug. I appreciate that, Gretchen. And I think um, one thing I would add that is, I don't is prob I don't know if it's in your, this documentation or not, but just that I really, I personally really appreciate in talking to Nate about his approach of being a listener and um, the style of leadership that that he intends to use, and um, and so. I, I just appreciate that he's not someone who's going to who's looking to go in and um, upset the apple cart, so to speak, but to really go in and listen and and be a learner um, on top of his experience that he has. He's very data driven. Yes. Anyone else? Uh just a question that I receive from my constituents often, which is what is the status of his application? Who's responsible for submitting it? Uh, John, could could you give us an update on his status? Yes, uh, Mr. Kelly has the application materials and as soon as he submits those, we'll begin processing through HR. And I believe he was just provided those yesterday, correct? Uh, I believe so. And he has intention to fill those out and drop those off today. Good, good. One of the things I have a question. One of the things that I hear from my constituents is what exactly was the process? How many applicants were considered and um, what applicants were considered? Well, I, I would say we're not we're not going back and rehashing the decision. On, I didn't ask at this point. the decision. What I asked was that these questions be answered. I mean, clearly this is where we landed, but I mean, I, I think that for public knowledge and consumption, it might be a good idea to address the questions of the constituents. I have an additional question. Um, so it, I, so will this be included in the packet then when it goes online? Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. Okay, so I'm just for people to be aware, I'm holding the org chart of the health department. So it looks like the health officer oversees and is supported by a chief medical examiner, which is a, an MD, uh, a medical director, a deputy administrator, and several managers. So this looks like a, a pretty great team in the health department itself. So I think this will be helpful for people as they... That there are different service lines. Right. Including clinical support. Right. I had one other question too for Commissioner Cosby. You had mentioned something about you call, made calls for three months. Um, could you clarify what that was? So the COVID positive test is considered a critical lab value. It needs to be called within a certain window of time. I think it's three hours if I remember correctly. And so our labs were coming in from multiple different lab results were coming in from multiple different locations. And because we did not have a physician on site, the, it was arranged that I would make, get, receive the phone calls, document mm -hmm. and call the patient. I had to notify them within three hours, but it was immediate okay. of the result. Does that make sense? That was during the doctor. During the government response to the pandemic was you were calling people. Correct. Who I received positive results at 2 a.m. in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It didn't matter. Okay. Wow. It's interesting. We have great community response. We really do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Commissioner Cosby. Yes. Yeah. No, I appreciate you bringing the information forward. I think you know we just we had a long discussion at the organizational meeting. Uh, my position on this is still that, you know, uh, Adeline Hambly is our health officer, and we don't have the authority or powers to remove her. I, you know, I, I would look forward to, you know, seeing the information you brought, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I just don't see the vacancy for Mr. Kelly. I don't know if we can address that. I, I mean, I, I, he can, he can have the greatest credentials in the world, but if there's no vacancy for him to be a part of, I, I don't see how we can go forward. Yes, we'll have to address that when the time is right. I would prefer to address it sooner, but I guess we'll address it when the time comes. And 
there, there is information, Doug, I know you've put online your legal opinions um, in regards to that, but there is MCL that addresses it. And there is even um, documentation that our own former corporate counsel has submitted in a lawsuit in regards to that. So um, perhaps I can provide that to you later. Okay. I, I think I've read both those documents. Like I said, I, we have the, the opinion of former E.G. Cox, as well as the opinion of our former corporate counsel. I'm convinced that we don't have the authority to remove uh, uh, Ms. Hambly from, uh, from her position, regardless of the qualifications of Mr. Kelly. So. Again, there is uh, documentation that our own very same corporate counsel submitted in a lawsuit in which, you know, documents our authority actually to appoint and unappoint um, the health officer. So I will provide that to you later. Okay. I have read that document. I think we just disagree about what that's saying, so. Okay. All right. Um, so any anything further on the information that Gretchen has brought to us today? I just wanted to say, I think Commissioner Curran asked a question and I didn't hear an answer to it. So I just want to come back to that again. Could you ask your question one more time? It's 11 o'clock. I was wondering if we could motion for, if I could make a motion for a short recess. Yes, you may. Actually, sure. I think that there's a question on the table and- There's a motion on the table. I'm happy to answer your question. Yeah, that's I'm There's a motion on the table though. So the motion should be addressed. Well, I thought we have discussion and then we take the vote. And as Commissioner Bottom has stated, the, the question wasn't answered during discussion. Right, there's a motion to take a short recess. So there's a motion, is there a second to the motion? There's a second. Okay, so let's take a vote. There's a motion on the table to take a short recess on favor. Actually, we need to take a voice vote, right? So let's take a voice vote. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? No. Mr. Bonama? No. Mrs. Miedema? No. Mrs. Curran? No. Mrs. Ebel? Yes. Mr. Balnap? No. Mrs. Rohde? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Um, four to five motion fails. Okay, Gretchen, I think you were yep. about to say something. So, due to kind of the, the current atmosphere, um, it, I, I don't feel compelled to share other applicants. I don't think it's fair if they were up for um, the position, if we were going to submit them for a position, I absolutely would I'd have their permission to bring their names forward. That's fair enough. My, then my question then turns into how many applicants were considered? That's just a number. Mm -hmm. And then how was the application process actually put out to the public or how was the application process conducted? The application came my direction. Um, I believe that was through Ottawa Impact and the number of applicants. Well, where and where else would they go? Um, the number of applicants, I'm not 100% certain. I can't really put a hard number on that, but I can get it to you. That would be great. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Cosby? Yes. Yeah, just to kind of uh, back up uh, Commissioner uh, Curran's question. So my understanding is that Folks reached out to you prior to January 3 to give you uh, names and resumes of folks who you may consider, correct? Correct. And you process these resumes and information prior to January 3, correct? I looked through them, correct. Okay, but you weren't an officer of, of Ottawa County. You weren't, a, you weren't a county commissioner. Under what authority were you re reviewing documents when, you know, you weren't a county commissioner and you had no authority to review officially okay. any documents whatsoever. That's a good point. We can talk about Open Meetings Act around that too. Um, no, I think that it was in preparation for my eventual position as county commissioner and then also responsibility to the county. 
Well, I mean, why can't I? We are, we are, why would I are, not be able to review those, Doug? I mean, you're not you were not a, a commissioner at that time. I mean, we can all review information, but obviously, the decision was made prior to the third when you weren't a commissioner and you're reviewing information. I think what you know, Commissioner Kern is saying makes a lot of sense is that um, folks giving you information for you to make a decision prior to the third when you you didn't you weren't hadn't taken the oath and you weren't an officer doesn't for me make sense right like to clarify something there i don't understand the question honestly i can look at whatever resumes or applications come my direction regardless of my position and right and but you made a decision made a decision as a commissioner but you weren't actually a commissioner no. It's made by the group. By the group. Go ahead, John. Commissioner Zalster, I think you need to be reminded that the board only acts as the board and makes decisions based on votes here in this room or when you're remote. I think you need to be reminded of that. I, I understand that, but what, what Commissioner Cosby is saying is that she reviewed documents and made a decision prior to the third. I've made many decisions prior to the third. I spent the last two years, two and a half years making decisions, Commissioner Zalstra. Are you going to attack me for my previous decisions to get involved in Ottawa County, to rally parents against inappropriate health mandates, to, to help assist citizens as they take back control of their government? I mean, what, what, what do you have against commission? You know, citizens okay. making decisions. I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say the following. I mean, if you think what you did was fine, I, you know, the action you was taken was taken. I, I don't believe that going through resumes prior to becoming a, a commissioner and basically making a decision before a commissioner makes sense to me. But I made a recommendation. Was taken by a majority. So I made a recommendation. I didn't make a decision. I made my own okay. personal decision, professional decision, but I made a recommendation. There's a decision. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, and I, I don't agree, but I, fair enough. The majority makes the decision. I get that. Thank you. Okay. And uh, any is there any other discussion? Okay. Moving on, this is now our second opportunity for public comment. If you wish to speak, you can come to the podium, state your name, and you have three minutes to speak to the board. Okay, I'm Rob Davidson um, from Spring Lake Township. So I was gonna come here to kind of point out Mr. Kelly's uh, lack of just basic insight into data. And you said he was data driven, but I just got a bunch of randomized control trials here about ivermectin and its ineffectiveness, and, and that that concerns me. But I guess I need to address a little bit more, because I don't think I'm going to change any of a lot of years' minds, certainly not a majority, whether or not you think this guy should be there. Um, but I guess for the Attorney General to review this video, as Commissioner Zoster was saying, uh, you know, Commissioner Crosby, Cosby was looking at resumes and decided to make a recommendation to the board before you were on the board. And, and therefore we're acting functionally as a, a de facto commissioner in your, in your own mind. And so if, if more than a quorum of you all from Auto Impact were communicating about that or other matters beforehand, I think the legal stance of many folks would say, well, you aren't commissioners yet, so you can't be under the guise of the Open Meetings Act. But if you were de facto functioning and operating as commissioners in reviewing applications for official jobs of the county that were not vacant, you you got to pick one or the other. And so hopefully the attorney general, when she is reviewing the Open Meetings Act, uh, possible violations. Originally, I was the one who said to people who were shouting that and saying, no, no, they weren't commissioners yet. But now that I hear this, that you all that you made a decision, you looked at resumes, you rejected certain resumes and you accepted another one before you were a commissioner, you were, you were functioning as a commissioner in your own mind. So you got to pick one or the other. You either have to accept that that was inappropriate or accept that you were functioning that way and the Open Meetings Act should apply. So hopefully our attorney general uh, 
reviews that and looks at it that way and recognizes that uh, the all were in violation of that act. Next, uh, Commissioner Moss left, but he said that you know mandates will not be tolerated and the board will not tolerate them. I mean, I will say you mentioned MCL, key health officer responsibilities, uh, it issues emergency order to control an epidemic, MCL 333.2453 code. So that doesn't rest in the power of this commission or, or Chairman Moss or anybody else except for the health office or whoever that may be. Mm -hmm. And then for Commissioner Bonema for positive options, I looked in their website. This is as activist as you can be as an organization. They specifically say the work of positive options to work belongs to the church, preserving life, building families, championing fathers, dis discipling young people in a Christ honoring sexual ethic and healing hearts wounded by abortion. Abortion is legal in the state. We passed that by about 60% of the population in the state of Michigan passed Prop 3. Um, th that If we're going to take a stance against activist organizations being linked to this county, that needs to be included. Um, <clears throat> you can't just pick one activist that you don't want and, and accept another. Thanks. My name is Dave Barnowski. I'm a voter in Port Sheldon Township. First, your, your candidate for public health officer is a joke. And the longer you can try to defend him, the, long, the more that you will become the punchline. Second, you are asking them, the public health officer, to give you names of people in their department. If you have a problem with an employee who fails to take your direction since you took office, you might have a point, but if you're going to go fishing around back into people's um, behavior before you were in office, before the policy of the board changed, it looks like you're going on a witch hunt for people who disagree with you. It shouldn't be done. She should give you zero names for anybody who did any behavior you dislike before you were commissioners. And finally, about your the chairpersons and Mr. Moss's illegal attempts to uh, influence the public health officer in public at a meeting. She has specific responsibilities and powers that do not pass through this board. You were told by Mr. Van Essen, you were told by the opinion of the attorney general, uh, the former Republican attorney general's opinion, you had a lawsuit that you lost and you had an appeal that you lost. You cannot do that. Grow up. Oh, Megan Ryan from Holland Township again. Just wanted to speak um, yeah, to some more about the application process for Mr. Kelly. Um, whether or not you violated the Open Meetings Act, I believe you violated your own Ottawa impact, impact contract that said, I will support a county resolution that instructs the county administrator and corporate legal counsel to take steps to make county information public by default to increase transparency and accountability. Private information should be the exception for public servants, end quote. You all agreed to that, and now you are refusing to give us this information on county business that you made. Maybe you weren't an elected official yet but you were a public servant if you were attempting to evaluate things that would be decided on by the county board. So I believe you should live up to this campaign promise that you all agreed to. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jerry Morlock. I'm from Grand Haven. Just a follow-up question about the um, activities that took place reviewing the resumes before uh, you took office. Were there also discussions with other commission members uh, before you took office about that position as you looked at these resumes? I, I'm addressing that to you. There's, there, there's not a two-way two communication during public comments, so you're welcome to speak with us, but we're, we okay. may not speak back. Well, I would be concerned if there were, if there, there was discussion among other commissioners about who to put in that position before you were all elected. My concern is not just with Commissioner Cosby. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Ovitz. I live in Spring Lake. I did not intend to make a comment, but I cannot let some of the comments that were made here by some of the commissioners go unanswered. 
I am very disturbed at the thought that parental rights would have some sort of, what shall we say, sacrosanct status of value or importance. I am a parent, but none of my children live in Ottawa County, and they're all adults now, as you can see. So my point here is that parental rights do not, in my view, epitomize the very highest authority in the land or in Ottawa County. If there is a duly authorized agent who is um, in charge of the entire community's health and well-being, I certainly would not to like, I would not like to have some parent down the street take exception to those orders and their voice completely override my own. I'm also very disturbed by the scapegoating going on here. I think that sounds to me very much like someone has a vengeful God who demands a human sacrifice. I agree with David Barnowski. There is no way the health department should um, give names of people who made an administrative decision under the authority that I don't believe you had any right to overrule. I'm very disturbed by some of the commenting I'm hearing here, and I will not repeat some of my concerns. Others have already voiced about possible, at least spirit, uh, violations of the Open Meetings Act. I am appalled at some of the things I continue to hear about this, and I will be pursuing this further. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dina Arner. I live in Holland Township. Um, I also would like to speak to the qualifications of Mr. Kelly to lead the public health department. Although you were quick to mention all the support staff that he would have in terms of various managers and professional um, healthcare workers that would be his support, he would be the leader of that department and he would have the authority to overrule the opinions of medical doctors and people who have far more information and credentials than he does. And that is the problem because with his public statements, he has proven that he does not understand or choose to believe evidence-based information. He does not understand how to analyze um, research studies. And that is not an imp that is not a trivial problem. Also, in terms of his leadership ability, there is a public video of him mocking the governor of the state. That does not go towards his leadership ability. How could anybody working underneath him respect him when that is how he chooses to spend his time? And I think up until three or four years ago, most people did not understand how important public health is, but we all got a rude awakening about three years ago about the problems we could have with public health. And a lot of you here in Ottawa County may not have realized how bad it was. You were not in Detroit where people were dying by the hundreds and they were stacking up bodies in hotel rooms. You did not have to work at a facility where you actually had to research how to get a refrigerated truck in case there were too many bodies for the morgue to take. Don't you smirk at me. This is a real issue. I'm a parent too. My children have the right to be safe in this society. Your parental rights end where mine start, just like swinging a fist. Do not ever get the idea that your parental rights override the rights of all the other parents in Ottawa County to live in a safe community, to make sure their children have accurate information about birth control and their own bodies and have accurate information on how to keep themselves healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? We do have someone online. Okay, go ahead. Joe Spaulding. Howdy, my name is Joe Spaulding. Uh, and I've been making fun of absolutely moronic anti-vaxxers for 20 years now. Um, it started off just for fun and then it got serious. Uh, 
you know, uh, you know, personally with COVID, at least um, my cousin got killed by that virus because he went to an unmasked church service on Thanksgiving of 2020. And then he got to choke to death on his own lungs because of other idiots who don't believe viruses are real. Uh, when it comes to the vaccine denial that I heard earlier in the meeting, that's absolutely horrifying. And I hope you guys go out and you look up the symptoms of measles on a small infant. Um, and you understand the fact that when infants are too young to get immunized, the idiots that don't vaccinate their kids are putting them at risk. The idea that we should allow putting foster kids and families with unvaccinated kids is absolutely ludicrous. It's the type of logic that led to an AIDS ap epidemic in Indiana under Mike Pence. And that's the exact same type of religious zealotry, dangerous religious zealotry, brought to the table by Ottawa Impact. But, you know, I grew up in Ottawa County, so this isn't anything new to me. As a Catholic, I was told multiple times growing up that I was going to burn in hell because, I don't know, we like the Pope or something, I guess. And there's nothing I could do about it because of predestination. But, you know, uh, when it comes to applications to actual people's real lives, it's absolutely horrifying to think that you guys are just going to want to, like, I don't know, essentially commit a biological terrorist act against the entire county. But then again, when we look at the words of Joe Moss earlier, uh, when he was talking about the, to the uh, representative from the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance, he was trying to stochastically t uh, uprise his uh, base of absolutely rapid lunatics to attack a nonprofit that helps poor and marginalized people in my community. Anybody, anyone of Joe, Joe Moss's acolytes or cronies that tries to step up to these nonprofits is going to have to go through me. Have a good day. Thank you. And I think we have one more um, in the audience. No, no, go ahead, Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie, Allen, Allendale Township. Um, regarding the activist, quote unquote, activist websites that were embedded in um, the Ottawa County site um, previously and re the fact that there's so much polarization, um, my only suggestion, which maybe isn't realistic, but is perhaps the government shouldn't be in the business of either of it, all of it, advising, um, I don't know, that's just my thoughts. Um, and then secondly, the, my only other thought was um, if those elected, um, waiting to serve, I forget the word, um, are presented with resumes and options from the community and outside the community to review, um, you know, for potential positions. It would seem foolish to me that there wouldn't be forethought research, um, you know, vetting done and um, and maybe some discussion even between those elected um, when they're not sworn in. Um, that seems it would be, I'm not, I'm no, I'm not crystal clear, but it seems like it would be foolish not to do that. Um, that was just my thoughts. Thank you. Was there anyone else online? We're good. Okay. All right. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. We have a second. Second. And. Do we need to vote on that? Okay, sure. so uh, I think we need to do a voice, voice vote again. So we're voting on to adjourn. Uh, Mr. Bonama. Yes. Mrs. Ebel. Yes. Mrs. Miedema. Yes. M Ms. Cosby. Yes. Ms. Rohde. Mrs. Yes. Rohde. Yes. Mrs. Curran. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Belknap. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Motion passes.